it's an awareness, it's moderation, and it's really being mindful of how we treat our bodies. And this starts long before menopause. You know? Welcome, Dr. Lauren Stryker, to The Girlfriend Doctor Show. It is great to have you here with me today. I am so excited to be joining you. We have so much to talk about, so I can't wait to get started. Narrowing it down to just a couple topics is, is pretty challenging. So we're going to hit this. We're going to hit on our hot flashes. We're going to hit on dryness. We're going to hit on cannabis and menopause and, and when, how, benefits, risks, and all of those situations, some guidance there in all of these areas. Now, I, I have been so looking forward to talking with you. You are all over the media. You are so prolific writing many books, and I've got a couple of your books here, this recent slip sliding away. <laughs> I love the, I, I just love the humor too, right? Frankness and then sex RX. So we're going to, we're going to talk about this because these are areas in our life that are uncomfortable to talk about. And what had, what have you found in working with women and talking about sexual health? Like what are the most common things that women come into you for? Well, you know, I run a menopause clinic here in Chicago. I run the Northwestern Medicine Center for Sexual Medicine and for Menopause. And I always say, you know, while we have women fill out a questionnaire so they have an opportunity to list everything that has changed in their lives and everything that is bothering them, at the end of the questionnaire, we ask that all important question. If you could only fix one thing, what would it be? And it's always basically the same four things. It's hot flashes. It's I want to get some sleep. I want sex to not hurt and help me maintain a normal, healthy weight. Those are the big four. And that makes sense because as you and I know, when we, when we talk to our menopause patients, those are the symptoms that are most common, even though there's a list of what, you know, another hundred symptoms that, that women have. Yeah, the most troublesome, right? That are affecting our quality of life and function on a daily basis. Now I'd throw in there the bladder leaking and incontinence issues that are, you know, like just don't want to deal with that, nor do we want to talk about it. So that's for sure. As you said, it's not just quality of life. What we're really appreciating is that it's also length of life. You know, when we talk about the impact of hot flashes, yes, women are miserable and they can't sleep and they're sweating through their clothes and they can't get through a meeting and it's impacting on every aspect of their life. But we also now know that hot flashes can contribute to serious medical conditions that can shorten lifespan. Yes, absolutely true. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about hot flashes as a symptom of underlying disease process, right? That goes beyond menopause. There is so much, finally, there's some good research that's showing up and that are looking at what, 2.2 times the risk of coronary vascular disease if we have hot flashes. That's right. And you're exactly correct. And not only looking at heart disease, but when we look at bone health, at osteoporosis, which is another huge issue, of course. And then when we look at even breast cancer, because what we know is when someone has a hot flash, what's going on in their body in addition to their internal furnace being out of control is that there's actually an increase in cortisol. There's an increase in the inflammatory response. And as a result of that, you have these inflammatory changes that can occur in every cell of the body, in our bones, in our blood vessels, in our heart. And now what we're understanding is that that's one, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that women have an acceleration of a risk of heart disease as they age and as they go through menopause. And what's so interesting is when we look at the data at all the studies, and we know, we, you know, we know that after menopause is when heart disease takes off in women. But if you divide postmenopause women into two groups, the flashers and the non-flashers, even when you accommodate for other risk factors like being overweight or family history or smoking or all the other you know, bad things we know that can cause heart disease, it's the flashers, it's the flashers that have the biggest impact on their cardiovascular health. And I think this is what was so important when I was doing, working with patients, going through menopause once, twice, whatever, three times, the, the issue that comes up with hot flashes, unremitting hot flashes, constant persistent hot flashes being associated with insulin resistance. Yes. And when we get a whole, when we become more insulin sensitive, the hot flashes completely 
go away. And we've seen that in our keto green community. Women are like, in two weeks, my hot flashes I've had for 10 years are gone. Well, and that know, piece is that insulin sensitivity. The insulin resistance is so important because even if you go back to WHI, the Women's Health Initiative study, which we all know is very problematic in terms of the design for all the reasons that I'm sure you've talked about a million times. The women were too old. They were taking an estrogen and progestin combination that we don't recommend anymore, that it was oral. I mean, we can go on and on and on. But even in that study, even in that study, with those women taking estrogen, there was a decrease in insulin resistance and it was protective against the development of diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And that was in all ages, not just in the young women. So yes, yes, yes. It's not just about, you know, being, feeling more comfortable. It is about minimizing these serious medical problems. So let's talk about therapy. So one is estrogen. Now let's talk about, you know, I want to address this and then how, how you and in your clinic too address it in clients with breast cancer, with current being treated for breast cancer, a history of breast cancer. You know, one of our biggest challenges, of course, as menopause experts is assuring women that not only is estrogen not dangerous, but that it's actually good for them. And we have a lot of work to do to re-educate not only patients, but quite frankly, other doctors who are not the experts we are, who don't really understand the data. And, and very often we'll spend a lot of time talking to our patients about the safety of hormone therapy. And then they go off to see an intern or someone else who's like, oh my God, go off that, you know, or don't only take it for a little bit or a small amount and they, you know, scare them. And I think the number one message that we have for women is that the overwhelming majority of women that it is absolutely not only the most effective form of treatment we have, but it is safe, safe, safe. And certainly we talk about what, you know, transdermal going through the skin preparations are in general safer than oral preparations. We talk about the women with the uterus that need to protect the lining of the uterus from taking estrogen. You know, they have different options in terms of which of the progestins they can use that are gonna protect their uterus. But our number one message is this is safe and this is effective. Having said that, we can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and a lot of our patients still say no thank you. Although it's always interesting to me that these same patients who happily took birth control pills, which is a higher dose and more potent hormone therapy for years, when it's time to transition over to postmenopause hormone therapy, they're like, no thank you. And in fact, this is even safer than birth control pills. But having said that, we know that there are not a lot of non-hormone options. But to get to your second point, the breast cancer patient, um, one of the things that I'm you know, out there talking about all the time that people just like scratch their head and say, are you kidding, is when I say that not only does not estrogen increase your risk of breast cancer, but it most likely decreases your risk of breast, breast cancer. And we have good data to support that. And again, even going back to that 20 year old study, the WHI, if you looked at the estrogen only group, there was a huge decrease in breast cancer. And that's the memo that we're trying to get out there. It wasn't estrogen, it was the progestin. And it was a specific progestin they used, Provera, medroxyprogesterone acetate. And we have other progesterones that we can use and other things that we can use to protect the lining of the uterus. So yes, you know, we know, we know that estrogen is fine for someone who is at risk of breast cancer. But the other question is, how about someone who has breast cancer, which is a little different because if they have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, you know, we, we don't know, we really don't have the studies because everyone's afraid to do them. But that if you give estrogen to those women, is it gonna stimulate recurrence? We don't know. So the greater good in the absence of data is to say, we're gonna use some non-estrogen options in order to treat your half lashes. And I think this is where it's important to really understand. I love what you said. Okay, so we're looking at estrogen risk and breast cancer, and we can feel really safe with estrogen alone. I mean, Women's Health Initiative study did prove that, right? It yes. did prove, and that's even with the worst form of estrogen, oral estrogen, which I really, I really transitioned by age 50 if they have risk factors, certainly by age 55 to a transdermal estrogen, whenever possible, we have such good ways right. to deliver it vaginally, transdermally, yes. because oral estrogens can increase the inflammatory markers yes. that lead up to coagulopathy and, and cardiovascular disease. So we want to switch. And so that's really important. It is hard to do for those who are on oral estrogen in your fifties and you're thinking, oh, I don't want to get off it. It's hard to switch, but it's so it's just better in the long run. And, and so that's a really big piece that, that I feel very compelled with. And then my, you know, our breast cancer patient, 
what options were given them and being able to look. I mean, 20 years ago, there was a study that was published that looked at vaginal estrogen in women with breast cancer, a history of breast cancer. And it showed decreased morbidity, decreased mortality with vaginal estrogen. That's essential, but we'll go, you know, you know, we're talking about that too for dryness. We'll hit on that. But in, in even with hot flashes, there's there's certainly like there's, there's so much that we can do. The insulin resistant piece is is key. And what will help our clients with breast cancer is that, you know, increasing insulin sensitivity and intermittent fasting through that, that will definitely help them. But I do feel safe in our, in our clients looking at the, some of the androgen data with testosterone and DHEA, certainly vaginally administered that there's, there's that, there's that very low risk, very low risk and improvement in quality of life that we can offer our patients even even during, even during that, that time. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think also we do forget, you know, to your point that while you and I are so comfortable with estrogen therapy for our patients, we have to face the reality of we're up against a big wall. And so we do need to be able to offer other options to our patients because this is shared decision-making. It's not just about what we think, it's about what women think and what they're comfortable with. And so I don't try and talk anybody into anything because we know that when you do, they will walk out the door and not fill the prescription. So, you know, let's, I always try and say, just you tell me, in fact, that's one of the questions we ask patients when they come into the clinic on our questionnaire is, what are your feelings about hormone therapy and it's multiple choice? And they can either say, yes, I'm excited. I'm all for it. No way. I would never consider it. Or I'm open to hearing about it. And we really pay attention to that because the people that walk in the door who say, I'm not interested, we try and give them our 30 seconds feel on it just to say, listen, you know, I know you're against it, but we just want to let you know that if you're open to this conversation, we think that this is a safe and effective option for you. And if they're like, we just don't even go there, you know, we just start to kind of go through all the other options, which are mostly off label, um, meaning that they're perfectly legal and we know that they're safe and effective, but they are not FDA approved for that purpose. But nonetheless, we still have a lot of options to offer our patients and a lot of things in development that are coming up that we think we'll be able to turn to. This episode of the show is sponsored by Jolva. Jolva is an all natural anti-aging cosmetic cream for your delicate feminine parts created by triple board certified OBGYN, Dr. Anna Kabeca. If you want to stop embarrassing urine leaks, reduce vaginal discomfort and dryness and reignite your intimate relationship, Try Jilva today at dranna.com and use the code SHOW10 to get 10% off your first order. What are some of your favorites? What's coming up that you can't wait or what are some of your off-label favorites? Well, as far as what's coming up is the, the, the what we call the candy receptor uh, uh, stimulators. And that's a company that it's uh, basically the candy receptor, just to be really simple about it, is the part of our brain that controls temperature, there's an actual neuron, which is called the candy neuron, um, which is the thermostat regulator. And we know that estrogen is necessary to keep it in control. And that's one of the reasons why when women go through menopause and they no longer are making estrogen, their candy neuron is just like an overdrive. And there's a new drug, which of course is nameless at this point because it hasn't been FDA approved yet. But basically it's a drug which will calm down that receptor, that neuron, and what they're finding in the clinical trials, and it is in phase three clinical trials, which is the last part of it before it gets out there, um, what they're finding in the phase three clinical trials is that it's like 95% of women are hot flash free. This is not hormonal. Um, so this is going to be big news. I just talked to the company because my book that's coming out, uh, Hot Flash Hell, I wanted to include a chapter about this new development. And I said, so how close are we? When are we going to see this? When can women go to the pharmacy and they get it? And they said, well, you know, these things move very slowly. They said, we're looking at 2023. So I said, okay. So it went from, you know, a chapter to a paragraph saying. Oh, this I is know, great. so frustrating sometimes. So frustrating. Do you know it's an average of 20 years from the time a drug is developed till it gets, you know, to our pharmacy shelves. And those are the ones that make it. Never forget the ones that don't make it. As far as the off-label stuff, you know, certainly we go to the SSRIs as we have been for years um, because we you know, discovered years ago serendipitously that these drugs that are being used for depression um, actually alleviate hot flashes. 
more than the number of hot flashes, it's more the severity. It takes those severe hot flashes down to a moderate or a mild. Brisdol, of course, is a very low dose, 7.5 milligrams of paroxetin, which in higher doses is Paxil used for depression. That's the only one that's FDA approved. Um, we use a lot of other ones off label um, that are a little higher dose, but you know, there's no free lunch, right? The problem with these antidepressants is a lot of women end up losing their libido, having problems with orgasm, gaining weight. Right. You know, we don't see that in the 7.5 milligram paroxetin in Brisdal. So that's you know, sometimes our, our first go-to because we're not gonna get those side effects but it's, it's not gonna be for everyone. Um, so we, we you know, have to kind of play around with it. And there are a lot of other drugs that we try and, and they all have side effects, of course. We have to try and kind of look at the individual. And that's, this is very individual, you know? Yeah. And, and we really spend a lot of time at our center talking to women and really taking into account what are their other medical problems? What are their issues? What might be what might be right for them? And one of the things that we are starting to talk about more is cannabis, cannabis, mm-hmm. because um, we know that women are out there doing it, and that they're doing it for alleviation of hot flashes. And while we don't have a lot of good studies, we do have a lot of good science behind it that can inform our ability to guide our patients and as to what would be the best for them. And I think this is such an interesting discussion. I mean, I really, I really want to go into this cannabis and also how it affects the anamide receptors. I mean, it's just beautiful stuff here, right? It's so yes. good. But I want to just uh, wrap up our hot flashes. We'll, and for a second, just kind of summarize because we covered so much, Lauren, and it's it's just so important. I want our audience to understand that if you're still struggling with hot flashes, right? And we're talking, we're talking hormones. We want your comfort level. You know that we're very comfortable. We treat patients. We see what you know, what creates breast cancer and what doesn't create breast cancer. And I want to encourage you that there's so much more, right? It takes, you know, from my book, The Hormone Fix, it takes more than hormones to fix your hormones, right? So in this, these these lifestyle changes that I, I encourage everyone to make, right? The, the intermittent fasting, the keto green living, the um, no more snacking. I mean, let's just cut that out and really empower our body's major hormones beyond the reproductive hormones, insulin, cortisol, and the most important hormone, oxytocin. And so before we move into cannabis, Lauren, I want to know, like, have you worked with oxytocin in your practice and um, what your experience is there? Yeah, no, that's not something I have an experience with. We have not worked with that. Um, But what we do emphasize to your point is um, it matters what you put in your mouth. Healthy eating is critically important, a healthy weight, a healthy lifestyle. You know, so often women come in and will say, I'm not going to use estrogen. And, and quite frankly, they're smoking and weighing 200 pounds. And like, really? You know, you think, you know, when we look at these other factors, because while we focus a lot about- Or the, the glass of wine every night, right? Well, the glass of wine every night's not so bad, but it should be <laughs> a glass of wine, not, not a bottle of wine. Um, you know, and I think with, like with anything else, it's, it's, it's an awareness, it's moderation, And it's really being mindful of how we treat our bodies. And this starts long before menopause. You know, I was doing um, actually a a Facebook Live with our osteoporosis expert last night, and this is a whole other topic about menopause. We won't get into that today, other than we were talking about the fact that it's the pediatricians that should be talking about this stuff. You know, saying, okay, now is the time when you're 12, 13 years old that's going to set the framework. So what you're going to, how you're going to be when you're 60 or 70. And that's, that's a hard one to to kind of address because our pediatricians have a lot of other things to talk about. But I think really that's the point. That's what we're both talking about is saying, you know, we're given this one body and we need to take care of it and we need to treat it right. And that's going to matter because we are living longer. We're living almost half of our life after the menopause transition so that we have to do these things. So true. I mean, you say that so well, and it's that time of puberty, right? Within puberty is is setting the stage for how well are we going to do with menopause. And so it's simply suppressing our menstrual cycles during that time is a really bad idea. No, and, I think it's a good idea. Are you kidding? I love to suppress. You, I think, you know, it's interesting that you should bring that up because when we talk about menstrual suppression, either with birth control pills or, or IUDs, um, I think we have good data that, to show 
that there are benefits to that in terms of uterine cancer, ovarian cancer. And what I always talk about is when you look at, at back in the cave people day, you know, and when you look at life expectancy and how many kids were put on earth, they have babies, right? And the typical cave person, cave woman had like 24 periods in her lifetime before she died. And the typical woman now has hundreds of menstrual cycles because we have an average of two babies. We start early, we start at nine or 10, we stop when we're 51. And I think in many situations, we can make the case for saying it's not so good to have a menstrual cycle every single month. And that in, in some cases, in some circumstances, we can make the case for suppressing it. Yeah, in some circumstances, but definitely later in life, we know like seven years of birth control pills decrease risk of ovarian cancer, but the earlier before age 16 starting birth control pills increase risk of breast cancer. So we have to, I think there's that, you know, we really need to look at the reason for the birth control pills to begin with, especially we have to have a better way because the oral estrogens, the progestins, I mean, this is, these are toxins to our system. So choose our toxins, right? We got to choose our toxins. And then I choose wine. <laughs> yeah, I choose wine. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on that. So um, beautiful discussion. There's a lot that can be done for hot flashes. Don't give up and, um, and, and that we have options. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel here and get those notifications and comment below. Let me know your thoughts, what you loved and what your action step is. Mm -hmm.